the Gate, Daily Racing Forms Weekend Handicapping Preview Program. I'm your host, Stan Illman. Thanks for watching. Here's what's coming up in this week's edition of Out of the Gate. Daily Racing Form Handicappers David Aragona, Mike Beer, and I will take a look at three major stakes races at Gulfstream Park on Saturday. Your DRF race of the day, Kentucky Derby Prep, the Grade 1 Curlin, Florida Derby, and for the three-year-old Phillies, the Gulfstream Park Oaks. Bonus coverage of the Howells Hope Stakes, a really nice betting race for older horses going a mile and an eighth. Nicole Russo's pedigree pick segment focuses on the Cutler Bay Stakes. Craig Wilkowski of Timeform US projects the pace of the Kitten's Joy Pan-American Stakes, plus horses to watch and best bets. So let's break out of the gate. We begin out of the gate with our horse watch segment. I want to remind everybody that David Aragona's weekly horse to watch segment on DRF TV. Well, stay tuned. It'll be probably back either next week or the week after. Stay tuned to video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel for David's content. Mike, your horse to watch has been at Oaklawn Park. Tell us about this long weekend. Yeah, Ron Weekend's a three-year-old colt uh, trained by Tom Hannes. Just a really fast uh, sprinter so far in his career. He's three for four lifetime, Dan. Um, all three of those wins sprinting. Let's go to last weekend uh, down at Oakland in the gazebo stakes. Um, this is his first stake start, his second start as a three-year-old. He returned from the layoff at Sam Houston and blew out an allowance field with an 89 buyer. He came right back in this gazebo, got right to the lead on this field, and never gave this field a chance. A 95 for this race. He's really fast, Dan. Um, I'm sure the water is going to get deeper for this horse, but so far he's made very few mistakes. He looks like he's got a, a bit of a future, this horse. Let me tell you a story about the curious tale of Minted, who's now a four-year-old filly trained by Brendan Walsh. This horse was stakes placed as a two-year-old sprinting in Ireland in 2018, shipped over to Chad Brown, was going to run in the PG Johnson stakes for Chad, scratched, done for the rest of the year. Chad enters her at Keeneland during their spring meet as a three-year-old. Doesn't get into the body of the race from the also eligible list. Gone again. Returns on March 7th at Tampa Bay off almost a two-year layoff and did some really nice things for Brendan Walsh. Let's watch the start of Minted's race. You see, she doesn't break very well. And considering that she hasn't run in over two years, you have to think, She's in big, big trouble, especially when you see her get very headstrong and is pulling her rider, Antonio Gallardo, past the stands the first time. And watch what happens when they hit the first turn. She is going to be floated extremely, extremely wide. And that's where she stays all the way down the backstretch in the four and five path. Perhaps luckily for Minted, they went very fast in the early portion of this race, but she made a prolonged run as we cut into the stretch. She's now making a three wide bid. She's catching this horse in front and she's gonna get away. Not bad for a horse that had never raced past six furlongs in her career. This was a promising first step back to say the least in her first start off the long layoff. Only a 76 buyer speed figure. She's probably not a superstar, but I think Walsh can take the necessary steps to find a non-winner as a two other than spot for her in the future. Keep an eye on that four-year-old filly, Minted. Let's get to some handicapping. The Curlin Florida Derby is your DRF Saturday race of the day. Let's take a look at the field for Saturday's DRF race of the day. The grade won $750,000 Curlin Florida Derby. Three-year-olds going a mile and an eighth at Gulfstream Park, carded as race number 14. You can download free formulator past performances for this race on the Race of the Day event page at drf.com. And for expanded stakes previews of all the major races this weekend, all the stakes on the Gulfstream Saturday extravaganza, head on over to video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel. They'll all be uploaded by Friday afternoon. Our colleague David Aragona is going against the favorite in the Florida Derby. Let's see who he likes. So the three major players in this Florida Derby are Tis the Law, Ete Indian, Independence Hall. Tis the Law is going to be by far the shortest price of that trio, and he really deserves to be because he was so impressive first off the bench last time in that Holy Bull, running by Ete Indian, who came back and won the Fountain of Youth so impressively, just crushing that field four weeks ago. Uh, but Tis the Law handled the mile on 16th that day like a stretch out to a mile on an eighth is going to be no problem whatsoever for him. That 100 buyer speed figure that he earned is among the highest in this field, and uh, he's just the kind 
kind of horse that has that running style where he can work out a good trip from really anywhere. He can be mid-pack, he can be up close to the pace stalking, give him whatever kind of pace scenario develops. He figures to get a good trip, so I'm not really against his the law. I just think he's going to be a pretty short price in this race, and I prefer the horse that could be the third choice of that trio, and that's the number nine, Independence Hall. Uh, Independence Hall, obviously, if he runs back to his Nashua performance from the end of his two-year-old season at Aqueduct, he's going to be tough for this field to handle. I think the real question with Independence Hall is, is he the same horse now as a three-year-old? He ran a lower speed figure in the Jerome 2 back, though he got the job done that day. And let's take a look at his last performance in the uh, Sam F. Davis at Tampa Bay Downs. Now, he did lose this race, his first career loss, but I thought he ran pretty well within the context of this race. The early pace was on the quick side, and he was very keen in the early going, tracking a couple of leaders who faded to finish really nowhere at the end of this race. He took over a much sooner than I think Jose Ortiz really intended to, and he just got run down in the late stages by Sol Volante, who got a perfect trip that day. Sol Volante did come back to lose the Tampa Bay Derby, but he basically repeated his speed figure that day. So I think the number for that Sam F. Davis is legitimate. Tis the Law does have to improve upon that effort to beat this Florida Derby field, but he's the one that's really bred to get extra distance of these horses that we're talking about, and I think he's going to be a horse that can continue maturing with experience. He obviously has some kinks to work out because he really threw a fit before the Jerome, but it seems like Mike Trombetta is getting a handle on that, and I think that Independence Hall is going to offer the best value of these three major contenders in the Florida Derby. Well, I'm also going to take a little shot here against the favorite Tis the Law. Not that he isn't the horse to beat because he is, but I, I really feel like um, along with Independence Hall, Governor Morris um, has may have a real chance to pull off a little bit of an upset in this race. Governor Morris um, got off to a really promising start to his career last year, an easy debut win at Saratoga in the slop. They stretched him out in a grade one for a second start. I thought he ran really well in the Breeders' Futurity just to be second best to Maxfield that day. And he came off the layoff for his three-year-old debut at Tampa last time. We'll take a look at it. Um, we're going to show you the stretch run of this race. Uh, he did bobble at the start of this spot. Had to chase the horse on the lead here, Untitled, who's a pretty nice horse in his own right. And Governor Morris just stays on very nicely in this race. I thought this was a real step in the right direction. He's going to overwhelm that horse right there, just past the eighth pole. And I like the way he goes on and finishes this race off. This horse is going to have to improve to beat this field. But I think there's a, the talent is in there for him to do it. If he gets the right trip, I'm expecting him to run a better race, maybe pull off a little bit of an upset here. I certainly respect Independence Hall. I certainly respect Governor Morris. I'm going with Tis the Law in here, unfortunately, at a short price. Perfect on fast tracks. His most recent start, he took care of Ecte Indien pretty easily in the Holy Bowl. We'll watch the stretch run of this race right now, and he just handcuffs Ecte Indien on the turn and takes over the lead and goes about his business. The story of this race was in the first furlong or two where he broke sharp, was shuffled back on the inside, on the back stretch, got to the outside, relaxed comfortably, and then is doing this to Ette Indian, who of course came back to win the Fountain of Youth. Tis the Law missed a couple of workouts. He sprang his shoe. He had a little hiccup, but it seems like he's over it right now. He's got great tactical speed. And if he runs anything close to that Holy Bull figure of 100, he's obviously going to be tough. Nicole Russo's pedigree pick segment focuses on the Cutler Bay Stakes. Then we'll take a break, but stay with us when we come back the Gulfstream Park Oaks for three-year-old fillies. Well, longtime viewers know that I think pedigree analysis is the most useful with a horse who's trying something new. And we'll find a couple of cases of that in the Cutler Bay Stakes. Let's take a look at the field for that race on the loaded Florida Derby undercard. Three-year-olds going a mile on the turf. This is a solid field topped by Vitology, who won the Grade 3 Palm Beach in his first start off a layoff, and Grade 1 Summer Stakes winner Decorated Invader, making his first start since the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. But if you're looking for some long shots to use with those two, who I expect to be the favorites, let's analyze those taking on new challenges in this spot. Moon Over Miami is making his first start on the turf, He's got a solid foundation with three races at a mile or longer on dirt, starting with this maiden score at Aqueduct. He was then fifth in an allowance won by New York Traffic, who recently ran well in the Louisiana Derby, and then eighth in the division of the Risen Star won by Mr. Monomoy, so he's been keeping good company. You think of Malibu Moon primarily as a dirt sire, but he is the sire of your odd multi-surface runner, including Canadian champion Moonlit Promise, a multiple graded winner on synthetic. 
He certainly adds even more stamina to a female family full of turf and stamina. Dam Zinzai was grade three placed going around on turf as a juvenile. The daughter of the versatile smart strike is from the family of French 1000 Guineas winner Musical Chimes, who went on to be a grade one winner in the U.S., now, another entrant in this field, Mr. Hustle, won all three of his starts last year as a juvenile sprinting on synthetic and turf, including this score in the soaring free on the woodbine turf. He's running beyond six and a half furlongs for the first time, and he's by Declaration of War, who is a good turf route sire with decorated invader in this same race. He's out of a mare by emerging broodmare sire more than ready, whose daughters have produced the likes of Breeders' Cup juvenile turf winner Structor. This is the extended family of some good two-turn runners like grade one winner I'm a Chatterbox and Jim Dandy winner Leban. The concern for me is not so much that this horse is stretching out, but that he's doing so off the layoff, and it's hard to have the foundation to do that. So in the Cutler Bay, I do think Moon Over Miami is your interesting long shot to try in combination with or behind the favorites. With Mr. Hustle, perhaps rounding out your superfecta, he might tire late, but move forward off this for next time. We'll be back with more on Saturday's Gulfstream card after this break. Daily Racing Form has the tools you need to master horse racing when you add buyer speed figures and DRF formulator to your handicapping arsenal. Go to DRF.com and use code DRF2020 to get a free formulator card today. Welcome back to Out of the Gate. Let's throw up the field for the Grade 2 Gulfstream Park Oaks, three-year-old fillies. Racing for $200,000 at a mile and a 16th. Remember, for expanded stakes previews of all the major races all weekend long, plus Derby Watch from Jay Privman and Marty Begee, the Timeform U.S. forecast with David Aragona and Craig Milkowski, and lots, lots more, visit video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel. David likes a horse shipping down from New York with a lot of speed and a lot of quality. I guess you could view this Gulfstream Park Oaks as a two-horse race between Toneless Shape and Spice is Nice, the top two finishers from last month's Devona Dale. Uh, they both ran well that day, and I've never been the biggest fan of Toneless Shape, but I am coming around to her at this point. She just does get the job done every time, no matter the setup or the distance, so I don't foresee her having a major problem stretching out to the mile on the 16th. The same goes for Spice is Nice, who really is bred to go farther as that daughter of Curlin. Uh, so I'm using these two, but it's not like they have some major speed figure edge over this field, and I think this race might be a bit more wide open than people perceive when they first look at it, and I'm most interested in the number four, Lake Avenue, who is now second off the layoff for Bill Mott. She did disappoint pretty badly in the busher last time, her first start off the bench as a three-year-old, but that's not a race that's set up the way that I think her connections planned for it to. Uh, she broke a little bit slowly, had to rush up and do a really fast pace that just completely fell apart. Uh, she might have been a little bit short that day because Bill Mott really didn't put that many works into her for that comeback race. I do think it's interesting that Bill Mott is now running her back on short rest, and she does have good races to get back to because we'll take a look at her demoiselle from last December at Aqueduct. She was really impressive this day. I know that the track was somewhat in her favor, uh, given that the race track was pretty speed favoring on Cigar Mile Day, uh, but she did well to make the lead from the outside post position in this race, led the entire way, finished off the race like two turns is no problem for her. Uh, now moving on to Gulfstream Park and her second start off the layoff, uh, it's not like she has to improve that much to get on terms with horses like Tonalist Shape and Spice is nice, and while the pace projector, the Timeform US pace projector, is predicting a fast pace in this race, I wonder if Lake Avenue might be able to use her inside post position to just get good positional speed, which is often dangerous in these mile and the 16th races. So I'm going for the slight upset with the number four Lake Avenue in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. I'm just going to take the undefeated tonalist, tonalist shape here in the Gulfstream Park Oaks. She has made no mistakes so far. I do think this is going to be a little bit tougher for her. She has to prove that she can get the two turns. Um, but I just think she's going to handle it. She's very versatile as far as running style goes. She does not need the lead, but she has enough speed to keep close to the pace. We'll look at her win last time. This is the Devona Dell, a grade two. This is a one-turn mile. And on this day, she just managed to find her way to the early lead when nobody else really wanted it. And at that point, I like that she just went on with it, put away a challenger on the turn, and she's leaving Spices Nice behind here in the stretch. Spices Nice is obviously eligible to improve here as she makes her third career start on Saturday. But 
I just thought Tonal Shape was much the best in this race, and I don't, I'm not really worried about her stretching out in this spot. I'm going to come right back to her in this race. I want to take a little bit of a chance with a horse that has to improve, and that is Lucrezia shipping down from Tampa Bay Downs for trainer Arno De La Cour. She has won her last two races, and she handled two turns most recently in the Sun Coast. Let's watch the stretch run. She took over this race on the far turn, and she's off to the races right now. Similarly to Tis the Law in the Holy Bull Stakes, she broke well, was down inside pressing the pace, was raided back off the lead to get to the outside. She responded to her rider's commands professionally, didn't get headstrong, and she showed some gears when she put away this overmatched field and glided on to her victory. This is a much tougher spot. I'm hoping she can get close to the pace in here. She should be in prime contention at a price when they swing into the stretch. We've handled the races for the three-year-olds at Gulfstream on the main track, the big ones. Now let's go for older horses in the Howl's Hope. Let's throw up the field for the Howl's Hope Stakes, the first of several graded stakes on a sensational Saturday afternoon card at Gulfstream Park. The Howl's Hope is race number six. It's a grade three at a mile and an eighth. $100,000 is the purse. For expanded stakes previews of all the major races all weekend long, plus lots, lots more, please visit video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel. It looks like there could be some hitting in the early portion of this race, and our friend David Aragona is looking for a one-run closer to pick up the pieces. I felt like there are a lot of ways to go in this Hal's Hope with not too many horses that you could really trust among the major contenders, and that's why I wanted to gravitate towards a horse that I'm pretty confident is going to show up with an honest effort. We'll see if it's good enough to win, but I'm most interested in the number eight, Sir Anthony. Uh, this is a horse that just consistently comes with a late run in his dirt races, and I think if you really parse his 2019 form, he was pretty good all year. He's never been a horse that is quite as good as on synthetic surfaces, so I can excuse his last performance at Woodbine when he just really never made an impact in that autumn stakes finishing sixth but prior to that i liked all of those dirt races we'll take a look four back at his victory in the grade three corn husker at prairie meadows uh, he came with a really good late run this day, going this distance of one mile and an eighth, and he ran down a decent field to get it done with a 96 buyer, a 120 time form US speed figure. If he gets a little bit of pace in this race and produces this kind of effort, I think he's going to be tough to hold off, and if you look at the performances that he put in after this last year, uh, I just don't think Sir Anthony got the right setups in his two subsequent dirt performances. Uh, he was behind a slow pace in that West Virginia Governor's Cup at Mountaineer after this, and then two back in the Lu Lucas Classic. He actually ran pretty well to close for third in a race that was mostly dominated towards the front end. So I think overall last year Sir Anthony is just a little bit better than it might seem. He's coming off a layoff, but he's run well fresh before. He's done well at Gulfstream Park, and as I said, this is the perfect distance for him, so I think Sir Anthony could come with a late run and cause a mild upset in this Hal's Hope. I'm going to go with American Tattoo in this race uh, for Pletcher, Dan. I like that this horse is um, just starting back here and coming back to the main track for this race. I think that's going to be really key for him. He did not run well on turf last time. But I don't think he's a turf horse. Um, I like his dirt form overall. We're going to look at his race two back. This is at Gulfstream last December. The H. Allen Jerkins, a mile and a quarter in a race that was rained off the turf. A very short price in this spot. He was supposed to win. He did win. What I really like about him actually are his other two wins since he's arrived in North America, both at Belmont going a mile and a 16th. He was under pressure all the way in both of those races, and he really fought on very gamey to prevail. This horse is a real fighter. I like that about him. I'm hoping he gets the right trip and I'm hoping that he drifts off that morning line. I don't know if I like him that much as the morning line favorite. I'm going to fish for a price in the house hope with the number five, just whistle for trainer Michael Matz. Blinkers come on for the second start of the form cycle. This horse's most recent race was his first race off of a lengthy layoff at Gulfstream Park. And he was beaten by Harvey Wallbanger, who's also in the house hope. But we're going to turn into the stretch, and you're going to see Harvey Wallbanger get the dream run on the turn while Just Whistle is in behind horses. Now, Just Whistle is going to eventually get clear past this tiring pace setter on the inside. And there's no match for Harvey Wallbanger, who is long, long gone. I think he felt the effects of the layoff in the last eighth of a mile. I think he should be tighter second off the layoff, and maybe he'll get just a little bit of a better trip. He's always hinted at some potential. I like him at the mile and an eighth, and there should be some pace for him to attack. So I'm going to give him one more chance. That's Just Whistle in the Howl's Hope. Craig Mulkowski of Timeform US is the pace projector for the Kittens Joy Pan American Stakes. Zulu Alpha is going to be the big favorite in that race. Let's see who Craig likes. 
Hi, I'm Craig Mulkowski at Timeform US for this week's edition of Out of the Gate. In my Pace Projector segment this week, I'm going to take a look at the Grade 2 Pan American Stakes. It's being run at a mile and a half at Gulfstream Park on the turf as part of the big Florida Derby card. And I believe this is the first time I've chosen a race with our no speed flag. You can see that in the upper right hand corner of our preview page in that small Pace Projector. <laughs> It's the gray sea details. When we look at a closer version, you, you will see that it says no speed. And what that label indicates, if you look down our running style column, is that there are no horses in this race who have a running style of speed leader or even tracker. So every horse in here has proven not to do that. Uh, let's take a, a closer look at the pace projector. Uh, and you can see on here, even though it, it shows the eight with a sizable lead, it's not really a horse who we're, we're going to look at later who I think is a real contender or even guaranteed to get the lead. Uh, in these kind of races with that no speed label, it is really tough to identify who is going to lead. Uh, and I don't want to give the impression that we always look for speed horses in these spots because we don't. And that was the reason for the creation of the label. These used to be races that would say favored horses on or near the lead, but we found that wasn't always the case. Uh, however, in this case, I did lean that direction as we'll see in just a minute. Uh, I want to start out talking about the favorite, Zulu Alpha. Uh, he has come off of two big wins, one in the Grade 1 Pegasus Turf Cup, the other in the Grade 2 Macdarmia last time out. Uh, both very good wins. Uh, he's sure to be the favorite on Saturday again. But I'm really leery. Despite his big speed figures, as you can see, he's been running Grade 1 type speed figures the last couple times out. He was only beaten less than two lengths in the Breeders' Cup Turf. He's a horse who just has very little early speed. Uh, you can see he's almost always near the back of the pack. If you check his first call or second call position against the field sides of the race, you can see very rarely is he in front of more than a couple of horses, if any at all. So while I think he is the horse to beat, he's one I'm going to take a shot against. Uh, next, I want to take a look at that horse we have projected to be the leader, and that's Manicomio. Uh, he's a horse who, if you just look at his PPs, for one, he, he's simply not a contender in this race. I'm not really sure why he's in here. Maybe he's in as, as a pace setter, but he's clearly not a contender to my eye. He's coming out of a starter allowance race where he wasn't able to even win that one. But I just wanted to show this horse so you could see why he's shown in front. He did show some, some speed in the dirt allowance race. Uh, he was part of another dirt allowance race where the fractions were really quick and he wasn't able to keep up. So he is the one we think is most likely to lead, but no guarantees. The horse I actually wound up siding with is Channel Cat. I think he's going to offer a bit of a price in here, and there's a couple reasons I really like him. Uh, one, I'm completely tossing that last race last out in the Pegasus Turf Cup. Uh, I don't know if he's a horse who has to have Lasix or not, but he didn't get it, and he threw in his worst performance in a while. Uh, before that, I was impressed by his race at just a mile and eighth, a race which is shorter than his best. Uh, he wasn't able to, to close in uh, all the way, but he was beaten less than a length with a good 119 time form US speed figure. But what I do really like is his efforts in the Bowling Green and the Sword Dancer, where he was able to stay much closer to the pace in the Bowling Green. He actually read, led the race, went wire to wire, set a quick pace, got a nice 126 time form US speed figure for the for the effort. And this is a field where I think he, he is definitely going to get a jump on the morning line favorite Zulu Alpha. And I look for a big effort from him. I'm not sure just how much value we're going to get, but I, I do think he's going to be worth a bet. So Channel Cat is my selection in the Grade 2 Pan American. Time for our best bet segment here on Out of the Gate. David Aragona has something on the Florida Derby undercard. So my best bet on Saturday is in race seven at Gulfstream. It's the Sanibel Island Stakes for the three-year-old fillies on the turf. And this is a race where I'm just not too confident in any of the short prices. Uh, topped by the number five, Cheermeister, who's gotten very favorable setups in her last two stakes victories. Don't think she's going to get that same perfect trip this time, so I'm somewhat against her. The number seven, Walk in Marrakesh, another horse who got a perfect trip in the Florida Oaks last time. She ran well that day, but we'll see if her trip works out as well here. And the number nine, Seducer, another horse who could take money in this race, 
finished one of two for Christophe Clement. Uh, she rode a significant rail bias in her debut victory at Aqueduct last year, so that's a performance that I do want to downgrade a little bit and just want to look for a bigger price in this race. And I'm going to swing for the fences with the number 12, Air of Light. Uh, this is a filly who's getting on turf for the first time, and she does have a pedigree that suggests she's really sh supposed to move up on this surface. Uh, she's by 14% turf sire, the factor, and we've seen the factor sire plenty of graded stakes level turf horses over the past several years. On the dam side, her dam La Song was a turf sprint winner. Uh, she was really best on turf and synthetic surfaces more so than dirt. Uh, so I do think this is a turf move up family. And Air of Light did show real ability in her maiden victory three back at Churchill Downs going the one mile distance. Uh, that day she did get a route uh, trip uh, without any real issues and she beat a pretty good field that day. I know the speed figure didn't come back that high, uh, but the runner up Beautiful Trauma came back with a huge victory at the fairgrounds. The third place finisher Temper is Rising subsequently graded stakes placed and there's further quality if you go uh, down in the also rands of that uh, field. I just think Air of Light has more quality than she showed in her last couple of starts. Also interesting to me is the fact that Norm Cassie, her trainer, has put her on nothing but turf for all of her workouts for the entire winter at Palm Meadows and plenty of those workouts have been pretty impressive in the mornings and it just seems like they've had this race penciled in for a long time. I like that they're getting ambitious and I feel like she's going to outrun her odds. So like I said, not the most likely winner but she'll be a huge price and don't leave Air of Light out on your exotics tickets. My best bet will be in race number nine, the Sand Spring Stakes, uh, one mile on the turf for Phillies and Mares. I'm going to try East Moon in this race. Uh, she's number eight in this field. Um, she's going to be a price in this race. She is not the most likely winner in here. I just want to bet this horse and give her one chance here as she makes her 2020 debut. Um, she actually has some pretty competitive form on turf, and I really appreciate the fact that she's a tactical horse. She can be up close to the pace, but doesn't need the lead. We're going to look at a replay um, of her race at Keeneland last October. On this day, they decided to put her on the lead, and she was forced along up there all the way, making a very legitimate pace. You're going to see her staying on gamely to the end. Um, and at, at one point here, it looks like she's actually going to make it. Ultimately, she's going to get a little bit tired at the end and take a really tough beat from a closer shooting up the rail on her and just nailing her on the wire. She ran really well in here. She had won her race prior to that from a stalking position. She's stepping up in class here. I get it. It's a tough spot for her, but she's going to be a price in this race, and I want to have a few dollars on East Moon. My best bet's in the Orchid, race number 10. I'm going to go with the number 12, Elizabeth Bay, 9-2 to two on the morning line. Elizabeth Bay made her North American debut for Roger Atfield and came from way off of the pace with a prolonged mid-race move and kept on trucking going a mile in a 16th. Let's go back to her second start in North America. This time she went right to the front. Looks like she's going to get swallowed up in mid-stretch, but she always finds just a little bit more and is actually getting away from this field in the end. The two horses she has to beat have questions to answer in the Orchid. The morning line favorite was able to control a glacial pace last time out against a weaker field. I want to see her do it again. And the other horse that I think she's going to have to beat is returning off of a very lengthy layoff. I think it's a good situation for Elizabeth Bay. And the folks might stay away from her because she's stuck in a tough outside post position, like her tactical speed in the orchid we thank you for watching out of the gate and we urge you to follow all of drf tv's latest offerings please follow on twitter at drf video and for the latest news and notes from america's turf authority daily racing forum please follow on twitter at drf inside post that's it for this week best of luck when your horses break out of the gate <laughs>